Hi, um, thank you again for joining me. And this is the final uh, t little time together in which we sit down and look at the book of Revelation. It's number 10. It's hard to believe that we've got to the end so quickly. It may have felt like a long time for you, but it's uh, gone very quickly for me. And I'm very grateful for you spending this time with me in, in the Bible, like getting to know Jesus and understanding the world around us. And I do pray that uh, in the days ahead, what you've what we've learned together from Jesus will be a great blessing to you. You know, this uh, this today the se the series will come to an end. I I'd love to do other things, you know. So if you'd like to, if there's things that you'd like to hear, you know, somebody said the other day, oh, I'd like to know about the tabernacle and the temple. Um, that, those are things that I thought quite a lot about. There's amazing things on the tab the tabernacle and the temple in the Bible. So I love to do things like that. You know, so if there's other things in the Bible that you think, oh, we've not really talked about that or heard anything on like that before, just ask me and I'll gladly do whatever you want and uh, be able to record it. And I've been working on something else as well that I think you might uh, just be excited by. Like um, over this sort of time in which I've had more, you know, time to do things, I've been working on a much big, bigger project uh, trying to like set out like the big story of you know life, the universe, and everything from the Bible. So keep your eye on that as well. I think that um, may be of some help, you know, in the future as we're able to do that. Today, uh, then we're in Revelation chapter twenty-one and twenty-two. Amazing and so like moving and glorious. Last time we left off by saying that. In the midst of this world, with all of its suffering and hardship and persecution and opposition for the church, we can stand firm and not give up and not be afraid because we know that Jesus is coming and that he will set all things right. And we like left that beautiful th with that beautiful thought that our names are written in the book of life. Isn't that so wonderful to think? Imagine, you know, we had access to that book. You know, just think about it, like all the things that we've ever said and thought and done that we've regretted, things that were wrong and sinful. And then we go to that book and, that you know, in the highest heaven and you see like you're going down the list of names and then you see like, I don't know, John Calvin, Martin Luther, C.S. Lewis, Athanasius, Augustine. You see these names and then you see your own name. You're like, Marcus Nelson, what? My name is there with those names. Like your name Put your name there as well. Uh, Jesus has written it there. Not through anything that you have done or I've done. It's all through what he has already done for us upon the cross and in rising again from the dead. We've been saying it again and again through the series of visions that the world at the moment is under the judgment of the living God. It's all going to come to a very abrupt end as Jesus comes to judge the world. Today... Like we've saved the best for last and we begin to look like at the other side. What happens after that? You know, there was this, uh, there was a, it, it's sort of, it's not really such a big thing anymore, but it was quite a big thing some years ago. People would stand on the street with sandwich boards saying, you know, the end of the world is nigh. There's not so many people around like that anymore. I mean, I used to be one of them in some ways, but there's not so many now, but it was this sort of feeling that when Jesus comes again, that he's going to end everything. You know, like that's just like the end of life as we know it. Of course, that's like not true at all. Jesus is not coming to bring the end. He's coming to bring the beginning as it really should have been. It's a new start, like a fresh start uh, for everything. And there are those that have thought deeply about these things. You know, Tolkien um brilliant like so you know that part where he says about in the lord of the rings about how you know after all the evil things that have happened and after the dark clouds that once they've passed the sun shines all the brighter so it's worth you know reflecting on talking and what he had to say about these lewis amazing in uh, perilandra like you know describing how all of human life in this world is just like a, a wrong step you know, like you step off a boat onto the land and you take a false step and then you straighten up and walk on again. It's like, yeah, all of human history is just a, a false step. And that will be like straightening up and then starting and beginning properly. And of course, you know, the end of the last battle, isn't it so beautiful and moving, you know, never ending future in which each chapter is better than the one before. Today, we're going to see a little bit of that together in Revelation uh, chapter 21. Now, 
Revelation 21 is, as everything in the book of Revelation, is drawing on the prophets and the apostles, but the prophets especially, and the law of Moses. You know, I've been trying to say that again and again. We never, ever want to look down on the prophets and Moses in any sort of like patronizing ways from some immoral, imagined moral high ground. No, we look up to them with the apostles. We look up to the prophets and the, like the law of Moses as the deepest and like foundational truths of the Christian faith. That's always been the way it's understood. And so what John's saying in Revelation 21, he's just drawing from like what the prophets have already said. So you know, like this resurrection future that Job had sp spoken like so movingly about, Job chapter 19, that Isaiah had spoken about so beautifully. Uh, different places like Isaiah chapter 11, it's well worth checking that one out. And then Isaiah 65 as well, like so beautiful and powerful descriptions. And John is in a way um, like sort of piggybacking off the back of the prophets. And what he's drawing on, uh, we'll see Ezekiel as well is like tying those threads together. He's not saying anything new. He's pulling those things that had been said of old together. Uh, and yeah, like sort of uh, pulling in like in this wonderful way, like sort of summarizing it all, we might say. Um, and then Revelation 22 verse one, so beautiful and moving. You know, I have read this at uh, many funerals that I've taken. And you know, when when a person or when a family is in deep grief, you think like, you know, the whole world has come to an end. How could we possibly go on? These words, like what is to come with Jesus on the other side, the new beginning have given hope and peace to the people in the most desperate and darkest of circumstances have given comfort and joy in all kinds of suffering. John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Let me just unpack that a little bit. So when it's new, there's two words in the original to what we would sort of say new as being. We would probably be distinguished by saying brand new and renewed, you know, if we were more technical. Um, what the, the word used here isn't brand new, but it's renewed. Do we see that? So it's the same heavens and earth that have been renewed. You think, what does that mean? What would give you an image of that? Well, the, the obvious place to look is that uh, Jesus, of course, like always start with Jesus and he'll explain like the, the deepest, deepest of things because he is the logos and the logic of everything. So just look at his resurrection body, for example. You know, when he walked out of the grave, it wasn't a different body. It's the same body which had died, but then like passed through into immortality and glorious resurrection life. Where he's gone, all of creation will follow. Okay, do we see that? So not brand new, but renewed. Um, and that, like, that's an amazing thought, isn't it? Because in recent times there have been, it's called like urban regeneration projects, you know, and there might be, say, a dock or a waterfront in which the buildings are refreshed and, you know, the insides are improved and people will move into them and pay a lot of money to live in them because they're generally quite nice buildings. That's a little picture. I mean, that requires a lot of work and effort and time, like just to regenerate a few little small buildings. Jesus is going to regenerate and renew and in every comprehensive sense, the entire universe. Isn't that amazing? Like, just to think that that's what he's going to do. And those, like, terrible, like, world religion, you know, those, like, terrible, like, depressing world religions that just say, oh, the only chance for the human race is to be, like, taken away from this world and to be whisked off somewhere else, you know, like, paradise or whatever they want to call it. Um, and like, you know, they just sort of give up all oh, this world. It's all gone. It's all going to come to nothing. You just want to escape somewhere else. That's like nothing to do with like the living God and his glorious dreams and purposes. No, Jesus is going to sort out everything. He's going to renew the entire cosmos. There's not going to be even like a single like millimeter or a single atom that is not going to be touched by his renewing power as he comes out from the most holy place as the great high priest and shares his resurrection life with everything. Um, oh, you can see how excited I am by these things. Let's carry on. 
um, because the first, uh, like, it passed away and there was no longer any sea. Now, people have wondered about that. They're like, what does that mean, like, no longer any sea? It means three things. First of all, um, as we've seen throughout Revelation so far, like, the seas in the Bible, like, this represents as a code for the nations. And the fact that, like, the nations of the world are in turmoil and chaos and restless and those sort of things. So that, like, restlessness among the nations won't be there anymore, okay? And the, the conflict and the struggle and the malice, all that will be gone. We'll see more of that in a few minutes. Secondly, do you remember we've tied in, and I, I meant to say more in it, I haven't been able to. We'll try again in the future that the, the sea in the Bible is linked with this other, like, dark and deep reality of the abyss. In the, in the Hebrew, it's tahom in, like, Genesis chapter 1. Remember, uh, and in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit of God, and the earth was formless and darkness, sorry, formless and dark, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, like, over this, like, dark abyss uh, is what, what how we would translate it. Um. It's like the other like dark reality that the living God says no to, and it is like the cosmic rubbish bin. The sea is like related to that. Okay, we can't exactly say today how it's related, but they're closely tied together. And that reality will be not on the inside, but driven out in what's to come. And then the third, so that's the second way. And then the third way is that um the sea and like and salt water. So remember throughout the Bible, salt is a code for judgment. Lot's wife back in Genesis 19. You know, sometimes people say that salt in the Bible is like preserving and you know things that because that's how it was used in ancient uh, you know sort of food practices and things. Yeah, that is true, but in the Bible, it's not used in that way, okay? All you've got to do is just look at how it's used in the Bible. It's consistently used just to represent judgment. Lot's wife, turn a pillow of salt, and then Jesus in Mark chapter 9, that's probably the best one, like, just to camp out on, that salt equals judgment, a code for that. And then Ezekiel and his vision, you might remember towards the very end, this tree of life and this water flowing out, fresh water, that goes into the sea and makes it fresh. You see what's being said again? It's like that, that judgment and the curse and things are removed, okay? Um, then John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. We've said it again and again and again. The big story of the world is that the Father, Son, and Spirit created the universe that Jesus the great bridegroom, loved by his father from all eternity, should love us and should like marry us and become one with us forever. Like that's the big story. Adam and Eve at the very beginning was only like to show that story. And that's what we all need to be and want to be part of. Like that's where the world's going. And that's where it's all like, that's where John's like tying it all together now in Revelation chapter 21. Uh, the, this great holy city coming down out of heaven, down onto the earth, uh, beautifully dressed for her husband like a bride. All of her sins have been taken away. All of like the evil and the things that made her unclean and defiled her have been washed away. And now like coming down and joining together with him on that great and wonderful day. And John says, and I heard a voice, a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Isn't that amazing? So the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit coming down from the highest heaven, the whole city itself like coming down and the earth and the heaven like the heavens that have been torn apart through human sin and wrong, like joined together in the way that they were always meant to be and becoming one forever. And like the Lord God himself, the eternal father, living with us and us with him and us seeing him for the very first time, like being with him, being with Jesus, his eternal son, like living the life of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing future and prospect that is to come. 
The old order of things in verse 4. Isn't it moving? He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Wipe every tear from their eyes. You know, one person uh, once said that the, you know, the story of the human race since it went wrong has just been one of suffering. You know, terrible suffering and pain and tears. And they said, like, very beautifully, you know, that all the oceans of the world we could sort of imagine were the tears that have been shed down the ages and across the world by those that have been hurting, suffering. And then in the Psalms, it's that wonderful Psalm in which it's said that, like, he's recorded those tears, like, he sort of keeps a record of them. And you think, what? Like, could he really know me? so well that he's recorded those tears and like kept a record of them all the tears that we've cr like cried throughout all of our lives he has he loves you that much that's how much he cares about you and he knows you even when we sigh we don't even need to call out to him <clears throat> excuse me even when we sigh he hears that sigh and he loves you and he knows you that well excuse me <clears throat> And so on that day, he will wipe away all tears, wipe away these tears uh, from our eyes. And we will be with him forever. There will be no more death. Isn't that amazing to think that there will be no more death? There will be no more funerals. We won't ever have to go to another funeral again. We'll never be afraid of losing a loved one. Never again. That will be ended. There will be no more death. There will be life with him that will never end. There will be no more mourning. You know, there will be no more sadness in that way. Grief for those that we've lost. That will end. It will never be again. And there will be no more crying or no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Like that old order order that old darkness will be gone forever like never even to be remembered or recalled in the days that are to come the days of Jesus with him now on that like glorious morning in verse 5 he who was seated on the throne said I am making everything new then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. These words are trustworthy and true. He promised that from the very beginning of the world, that he would set everything right and would bring about his new creation. And he will deliver on all that he's promised. In verse 6, he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the A and the Z, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning. Remember we said like right back a long time ago that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. What does that mean? Like think about it. We can't say today, but what does that mean? In the beginning God created and the heavens and the earth and Jesus says, I'm, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm where everything came from and I'm where everything's going towards Wonderful things about who this Jesus really is. And then he says, To him who's thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this and I will be his God and he will be my son. This longing that we all have for fulfillment and satisfaction that we try to satisfy in all kinds of other things in overeating and over drinking in addictions in relationships with others in holidays in money and possessions and they never ever satisfy jesus will by his spirit who is that water of life give us life that will satisfy our deepest longings like then and forever and will like allow us to overcome as we trust him. Like that's how we overcome as we trust him, as John says in his first letter. 
But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the, the murderers, in verse 8, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So those that refuse to give up, like that old, horrible way of life, that's going nowhere, it's going like down into everlasting darkness, will in the end like go there. And it's striking, isn't it? Like the first one, like the first thing that's said is cowardly. Isn't that, like I find that really challenging, like not to worry about any of the others, but cowardly. In other words, like those that take other people more seriously than they take Jesus like can't have any future in what Jesus is coming to bring. If we fear other people and allow them to control who we are and what we say and do, she's like, well, you can't be a part of my future. Isn't that so striking? You know, as I thought about it, I thought, I've got to really repent, Lord, and say sorry, because I know that quite often I am afraid of saying things that I know that other people don't want to hear. Jesus is like saying, no, you must fear me more than anybody else. And but the encouragement to us is, is that doing, like being courageous isn't just doing things in the absence of fear. No, it's like trusting Jesus and doing things even when we are afraid. Do you see that? And that's what we need him like to do within us, like to say, Lord Jesus, I'm afraid. Help me. I'm a coward. Help me to stand for you and to live for you, like no matter what the cost is, to like hold your flag high and to I call us to your mast. Um, now, in verses 9, we'll move on. Like, so 9 to 21. What then happens is one of the senior angels, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, full of the seven last plagues, came and said to me, come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So this like great heavenly city that the angel like shows John, like the vision of this like city which is coming down onto the earth, the city of heaven. Now, what, what, what John's doing here is he's drawing on what the angel's showing him is drawing on what Ezekiel had already described in much, much more detail in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48. So Ezekiel gives like, a, a much fuller like description of this because John's only really got half a chapter. Well, yeah, half a chapter on it. Ezekiel's got eight chapters on it. Now, what we just need to remember, like just to help us, to the, the first thing is that the, now, the temple... Uh, and the tabernacle that were before it were like a little model. I, we've maybe said this before, but if you haven't heard this before, don't worry. The, ta the tabernacle was, you know, uh, uh, just a tent. And then the temple was like a permanent or like a more permanent um, form of that. And they were both models for creation, like the heavens and the earth. So the way it was structured was just like a little model uh, for that. So there was the inner room, which was a perfect cube. You're like, oh, I wonder why that might be the case. Uh, just like the city of heaven is, of course, a perfect cube, you know, 12,000 by 12,000 by 12,000. And then there was another outer room, which was like the, the holy place. And they represent like the heavens and the earth. Okay. There's more to it, but that's just the, the basic sort of thing. Um, and so in that way, when Ezekiel, like, so he uh, describes it in a lot of detail, and then he says that, like, all of that is kind of renewed, so, like, the inner part and the outer part as well, that's a code for really saying everything is renewed. Do we see that? Like, so not just the, like, the physical temple in Jerusalem, but, like, everything in the whole cosmos is renewed in the way that Isaiah had also said and the way that now John is saying. And um, so that's, like, the first thing to say, okay, like, that, it, that it's a code again, like this, like the city and the temple things. They're a code uh, for like the renewal of all things, and um, and then like the reality of that city that's coming, like these foundations that are secure, 
the walls that are secure, like the angels guarding the gates, all of these things like are describing um, a city that is like it what it seems about like what it's made of are like the same like that the same kind of things that God the like to characterize God the Father back in chapter four. The same like you know precious stones and of course are the same like precious stones as were on the high priest of the uh, I'm sorry the breastplate of the high priest uh, back in the book of Exodus. We really have to get into it, like the tabernacle and the temple and Exodus things in the future, but sorry, that's for another day. And um, so those like it brings all those things to mind. Okay, so we're thinking about all those things um, as we see it. Uh, and then that like, so it's a code for like all of creation being renewed and that this like new creation future as the heavens and the earth are brought together is one in which there's safety, there's security. It's all like under the control and the governance of the living God and safe forever. You know, if you're afraid, you know, if you're afraid for your life, it's no life at all. It's slavery. And um, you know, in this country in general, like we're generally quite safe, you know, but when you go to other parts of the world, um, you're very conscious, you know, so the first time that I went to South Africa, for example, I was very, you know, conscious that there were often bars on the rooms uh, of the house and that, you know, people were much more aware of like security issues and that sort of struck me. And I thought, you know, I would, it's an amazing country. You know, we love South Africa, but I would have found it quite difficult to live in South Africa because I wasn't used to those things. This like future with Jesus in the new creation is safe and secure. Nobody's going to come in and hurt us or nobody's going to come in and disrupt things. No, there is complete stability that will last forever. Now, the thing like off the back of that, to say, so the other thing he says, like it is a code for like the heavens and the earth being renewed and secure and stable and safe. But also from the very beginning, there is like a general awareness that it is like the city of heaven is a real place, okay, that actually exists now, right, right now. So Heaven is, you know, so, sorry, creation structured is the heavens and the earth. And we've said that there's, you know, the lowest heaven of the sky. And then the second heaven is like what we would call outer space. And then above that is the highest heaven, the city of God. And that is what it has been like right from the very beginning. Because like, think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, everybody else was like building cities during their time. Okay. And, but they didn't. What did they do? They lived in tents. Now, it wasn't just because they sort of liked go outdoors and they liked, you know, that kind of nomadic lifestyle. That wasn't it. There was a lot more going on. Hebrews chapter 11 just says it was because they were looking forward to that city who had, whose foundation and builder is God himself. So they were looking forward to that glorious city of heaven and all that was to come when that city of heaven would come down onto the earth and everything would be brought together the way it was always supposed to be. Um, the way it's measured and things. So it is a real place right at this moment that when a Christian dies, that's where they go to be with Jesus. Those dimensions, you know, 12,000 stadia cubed. Again, like it's symbolic, you know, of like under control and power and governance of the living God. But like, just say for sake of argument, we would say, how big is that? Okay. Just to get an idea, it's about 14,000 miles by 14,000 miles by 14,000 miles. Now, the real city of heaven, if anything, is probably bigger. But just imagine like a city that's, you know, the size of Australia roughly and then as high as it is long and wide. Like an incredible thought that what's being described here is like a whole other level of reality to what we've experienced so far. And Christians down history and across the world have like longed for the day in which they like they die and they go to be with Jesus because when they die, they don't really die in that sense. They just go to be with him, which is better by far. And Bunyan and many others have described like so beautifully that experience of what it will be like for, for each of us if Jesus doesn't come back again, first of all. Um so do we see what I'm saying? So the city of heaven is a very real place at the moment and that Jesus is there with his father and the Holy Spirit and the angels and all the church of the triumphant of the ages are there with him. But that city is going to come down onto the earth 
when Jesus comes and he will renew everything and heaven and earth will be brought together and married and become one. Then what like we what we then begin to see is, you know, you think like, but what on earth would like that kind of life be like in the future where heaven and earth come together and everything's sorted out like a new beginning? We start to see in verse 22, like little glimpses of the glory that's to come. John says, I didn't see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the, uh, and the Lamb are its temple. So there's no like sort of separation anymore. Like it's not like you have to go somewhere. No, like the Father and the Son are themselves like the temple and everything else which will be on that day is like sort of held within them in a new and deeper way. So we live within that temple. Like, oh, wow. And like, that's awesome. Uh, like just to begin to think about what that might mean. The city doesn't need the sun or the moon to shine in it for the glory of God gives it its light and the lamb is its lamp. So remember what we said right at the very beginning, you know, it was formless, empty and dark. And then God, the father said, let there, or we can go both ways, let him be light. And then the, the sun is created on day four as a little actor and a stand-in. And John the Apostle says, you know, that the true light, which was giving light to every man, was coming into the world. So in other words, the S-U-N in the sky is like a tiny little stand-in and a little actor for Jesus, who's the real and true and uncreated light of all. I always imagine, you know, in, in Africa, in South Africa, if you've ever been to the con the mighty continent of Africa, you know, when you see the sun rising at, in the morning at dawn, it seems so much bigger than it does here. We don't see it so often. But if you kind of imagine that you were standing in front of the rising sun with a tiny little torch, you know, your tiny little torch would seem very small as the great like, rising sun rises up. But then like imagine that that mighty rising sun is like a little torch as well compared to the one who stands behind it. Glory, Jesus like I borrow as like lent a little bit of his light to the sun and then the sun moon and stars will can be sort of put aside and Jesus will shine and his light will fill the whole universe and there will no longer be day and nor night and day that old pattern will end and there will be his everlasting day that will never end and go on forever and ever and then this glorious vision you know, we've said a lot recently, there's been, uh, you know, so many issues across the world in terms of racism, institutional racism, historic racism. And, it, you know, it's been brought very much to the front of like public attention. And we've said that the only person who's big enough to join all the nations together in one, in harmony and unity is Jesus. In a way that he doesn't like squash us all down and like make us all become some strange mush, but rather no, like he allows us all to flourish and to be ourselves and to be ourselves together in a way that we don't threaten and harm one another, but we, we just get on and we love one another. We actually like sort of cross pollinate, if you know what I mean, like we, we bounce off one another. That's such a glorious vision of the future. Look what's said, the nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Isn't that glorious as well? We saw those kings, you know, that wanted to be side with Babylon. But there will be other kings who will come and bow down. We know, main, we know you know, the names of many of them um, that will on that day, you know, gladly lay their crowns down at his feet. And will, like, you know, hail him as king of kings and lord of lords. And they come, and then, like they, they, they will bring like their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Like there's no need to have bars at the gates. There's nothing to be afraid of. There's no darkness. No, it's always safe and open for everyone forever. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Isn't that so awesome? And you think you know like that. It's okay, you know, so if I'm Northern Irish, it's okay for me to be Northern Irish. Jesus doesn't hold that against me. If you're Welsh, 
It's good for you to be Welsh. Jesus doesn't hold that against you. He loves the fact that you're Welsh. If you're English, Jesus loves the fact that you're English. If you're South African, if you're American, you know, if you're Indian, if you're Chinese, and then just imagine like something of that glorious vision of what's what's to come when you know the greatest like Welsh men and women like sit down with like the greatest African like thinkers and you know you sort of like bounce off one another and then we like learn from the Indians and we learn from the Chinese and we like oh this is how you do art oh this is how you do poetry this is how you do music this is how you do architecture and we like enrich one another we could say more what a glorious vision that is and what is to come and what's possible or in like in that glorious never-ending future nothing impure in verse 27 will ever enter it nor will anyone who does what's shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the book of life so all that's bad and evil will never come in it's all driven onto the outside put in that like darkness the second death the abyss the lake of fire no access it's safe the glorious future with Jesus is safe for all the nations of those and all that know and love him. I praise the Lord. Then in 22 verse 1, the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations no longer will there be any curse the throne of god and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads there will be no more night they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the lord god will give them light and they will reign forever and ever the angel said to me these words are trustworthy and true the lord the god of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place that um great like tree of life you know at the very beginning of human history our first parents went wrong weren't allowed to go back to it and so were driven away and from that point people began to plant trees Abraham did it a lot others did it a lot because they wanted to live in the shade of this great tree and then in the book of uh, Daniel chapter 4 Nebuchadnezzar sort of imagined that he was this great tree of life to provide shelter and life for all the nations of course he wasn't but you could sort of say oh it's interesting that he should have thought that and in Ezekiel 31 uh, like the Assyrians had big aspirations as well and then jesus just very simply says his kingdom's like a little tiny mustard seed but it grows this great tree isn't that interesting so this great tree of life like jesus himself and his kingdom providing shade and healing and life for all the nations and then this river of life <clears throat> flowing from like him of course his holy spirit giving life you know satisfaction life that never ends with him and that's what we need like then and now is that you know it's so easy just to go through this life like half asleep and just existing and even subsisting but we need to come alive jesus can make us come more and more alive by his holy spirit now and just imagine what life is going to be like with him then. John is overwhelmed. And this, with this, you know, we're drawing to a close. John is overwhelmed by what he's seen. And we don't blame him. He wants to worship the angel, you know, that sort of helped him out, like seeing these things. And then the angel's like, no, 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 don't do that. Like worship the living God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. I'm just a little servant like you are. And then... Um, you know, he says to him, like, don't seal up the words of this prophecy. Remember Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, Daniel was told to seal up the words of the prophecy until like the last days. And now the angel is saying, no, 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 don't seal up these words. Don't keep it on the shelf. Don't hide it away. Just share it with the world. Tell everyone about what's said here. And then like that thing, you know, like, let those who are vile continue to do vile. Let him who is right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. In other words... We, we act out of who we are. So if we're bad trees, we will do bad things. 
We need to, of course, be born again so that we're no longer bad trees, but we're made by Jesus to be good trees. And then we will do good things as we like trust and follow him. And then Jesus says, you know, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And then like just skipping on to verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever's thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Isn't that amazing? Jesus saying, it's all for free. It's all in the house. I will give you my life of my spirit that will never end. Just come and receive. The spirit saying that. The bride, like the church, is saying that to the whole world. And we don't want to take away from anything that Jesus says in the scriptures, nor do we want to add anything to what Jesus has said. And then at the very end, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. We've seen from the very beginning that Jesus is the first and the last, the eternal son of the ancient of days. He is the the one who is the light and life of the whole universe. He's coming soon to usher in his new creation. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's the root and the offspring of David. He's David's son and he's David's ancestor. He is the one that Moses wrote about in the law. He is the one that Abraham was glad to see. He is the one who traveled with Noah in the ark. He is the one who delivered his people from Egypt. He is the one who appeared to David. He's the one that met Isaiah in the temple, who helped Daniel in the lion's den, who helped Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a fiery furnace. He is the branch, the desired of all nations, the messenger of the covenant, the son of man, the son of God, the great high priest, the lamb of God, the bright morning star, the bridegroom, the rider on the white horse, the son of God, and the one who is coming soon. He says it again and again here in verse 7, behold, I'm coming soon. In verse 20, yes, I'm coming soon. He can't wait to come. Can't wait. He's been waiting for some time, waiting for his father to send him. He's not waiting a moment longer than he has to. He can't wait to set everything right and to usher in this glorious new creation future and for you to be with him and to be a part of that when he comes. And so our whole lives are in the word, like those last words, Amen, come Lord Jesus. You know, those words could sum up not just the end of the Bible, but the very beginning as well. From the very beginning of the world, the church of Jesus Christ, those that have known and loved him, have longed for him to come, longed for him to be come down and become our brother, to save us by his death on the cross and rising again from the dead and ascension, but longing for him to come again and to sort everything out to usher in his glorious new creation and to begin the world as it really should have been. Dear Christian, are you longing for his appearing? I can't wait. I'm all each morning, you know when we rise, we get up and think, is it today? Is today the day? We're not looking for death. We're not looking for the grave. We are looking for Jesus. We're looking for him to come. And to set everything right and to bring about his new creation. How we long for that day and what do we say together? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. I was going to close by reading uh, that wonderful old hymn of Charles Wesley. But I, I don't think I actually can. But if you're able to, uh, look at those words. It's called Away With Our Sorrow and Fear. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Have a look at those wonderful words. It's an old hymn by Charles Wesley called Away With Our Sorrow and Fear. And just read those words and you will be blessed and encouraged. Jesus loves you. Thank you for joining me. With Jesus, the best is always still to come. Keep trusting him. Keep holding on to him and keep longing for that glorious day when you see him, when I see him for the very first time. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.